This is the Cafe Racer Podcast, episode 110 for July 1st, 2017, and I'm Crash. So those of you that are listening may have noticed that Steve was by himself interviewing someone last week, and I am by myself interviewing someone this week. So uh, we've got Tom John on from Purpose Built Moto. Again, you may remember him from a few months ago. How's it going, Tom? All right, mate. How are you? Good, good. I'm back in San Diego since the last time we talked. Um, it's it's nice. Midsummer for you guys, huh? It is, yeah. It's it's just starting to be consistently warm. Uh, June was a little bit, you know, up and down, but now it's like consistently sunny and warm. My parents, who live in Arizona, I went and visited them last weekend, and it was a hundred and ten degrees most of the day while we were there. I don't know. Man, I'm do that. suffering through mid winter over here. It's only like twenty eight degrees during the day now. It's horrible. 28 is like <laughs> 80 something for us, I think. Yeah, it's it's not so bad. I actually went out for a ride this yesterday morning with the boys. Uh, nice. We don't get much of a winter where I am. It's great. There are worse things, I think. Snow, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. Snow can be fun. Not no, if you ride bikes. <laughs> no, not 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 the best thing. I mean, there's those all. all there's always those videos of those guys from Iceland. And stuff with like the, like the ice pick things built into their tires, just going crazy. Oh, yeah. Man, I have this uh, this group um, called the Adventurists. They run mm. these like wild, um, like a charity race kind of thing. But they do a heap of them. So they do some through South America where you jump on monkey bikes and kind of cross the jungle um, for a week on these tiny little bikes. And they also run one in northern europe that nice you get like an old ural or a bmw and race across an ice lake for a few days um <laughs> and like i really want to do it but i just gotta it find sounds like, amazing well yeah i gotta find like a someone mad enough to come do it with me yeah that sounds awesome yeah i mean it'd be cold and grueling but kind of the experience of a lifetime right yeah but i think yeah. um, me and my mate i'm gonna catch up with him later the Savo. He um he's keen to do the monkey bike one, so we're gonna try hit that up next year maybe. Yeah. He's like There's, he's not a bike guy, but I think that's why he called me. So if if things go astray with uh with the bikes, I can fix that. But he speaks fluent Spanish, so he can kind of help us out <laughs> with oh, uh, communicating with the locals. Yeah. Um, the uh, um, th there's a group of people out here that do a thing. Uh, called the five 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 and you have to get it's a it's like this this is like group of friends and they, they they come up with extra challenges on top of this but the the core principles are the bike has to be made i think it's before 1975 mm -hmm. so that's one of the fives and then it has to be under 500 cc's and cost under 500 dollars and then they do just, you know, bonkers stuff with like they 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 took um they just built like Honda 305s and stuff like that and and drove them across the country and then they made five hundred dollar sidecar rigs with five hundred nice. cc bikes and rode them, you know, a different way across the country one year. Like it's 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 mental. Like <laughs> it's just super, yeah. super crazy. See, if you were to do that kind of thing out in Australia, it'd have to be like the five, five, 25, because 500 bucks in the U S I know it gets you a pretty decent bike, but 500 mm -hmm. bucks in Australia for a bike before 1975, you're getting like a milk crate full of parts <laughs> for 500 bucks at the moment. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you're pretty hard pressed to find a good deal. You get like the plate that the VIN was stamped onto and that's it. 
Yeah, maybe the front brake if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I've heard that Australia has some pretty serious, like, uh, like if you're not, I guess, serious, they're pretty strict on like bringing bikes in from other countries. Like, if uh, you're traveling, and, like if you're traveling, well, I've heard that like they'll they're very quick to make you like either fix an, like a small oil leak or you know like it has to be pretty pristine if you're trying to bring your bike and ride it in Australia as a tourist. Yeah, I think there's like there's ways and means around that kind of thing. We have strict import regulations on bikes made after 1989. Oh. But before that, it's kind of classed as vintage, so it's open slather. You can kind of do whatever you like. Um, so I got caught with that. When I when we spoke last time, I told you I did that trip from Seattle to Mexico on a bike. Right. Um, and I wanted to send my Harley back here just because I like grew to love this big old bathtub that I was riding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to do it and I made the mistake of buying a bike that was built in 1989. So that takes your import from like maybe under a thousand dollars to over three thousand dollars because of the compliance regulations and stuff. It's pretty steep. Ouch. Yeah. <clears throat> Here, um, I, I just heard actually just the other day that uh, there's another guy that does the Cleveland Moto podcast, and he because we're this our country is really like. It's almost like several different countries, all, you know, all the 50 individual states are like their own little country and have a lot of power over things that seem kind of strange to me, even as someone that lives here. But like every state's import regulations are a little different. And so he's like, I, because of where he lives in Ohio, I guess, he's able to import with practically no restrictions anything that's like over 25 years old. So like 1992. Um and so like he got a like a little nissan um uh, like van like a little like micro van thing that's got like oh, a thousand seat the engine yeah yeah i've seen we have like so we have i've seen them running around here they're pretty hilarious looking little things there it just makes me think of the there's these little piaggio um like little van truck things that have their motor in the back um underneath the pickup bed and they're they're tiny and we had them uh, when I was in Italy. There was a couple on our little flight line that would always run around dropping stuff off. And we actually like got like three of us together and like picked one up and moved it somewhere <laughs> just to irritate the people that were driving it around everywhere. Like they got out and ran into the building to do something and then we moved it around the corner. <laughs> well, if you drive a small car, you kind of ask for that kind of behavior. I guess so, yeah. If you drive a small car around idiot Americans... With you know very little sense. <laughs> so um, the reason that we had you on the show is uh, you you had an event recently called Moto Social, uh, Moto Social Gold Gold Coast, um, and apparently that went off pretty pretty spectacularly. Yeah, yeah, it went super well, overwhelmingly well, better than expected. Um, we kind of. It was myself and uh, a, like the the guys with the venue where the event was held, Sandbar. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like right on the the Esplanade Beach. Um, it's this cool like restaurant, bar, cafe, and the guys there are, are bike nuts. So they approached me with this idea for the event, and kind of they organised bands and all that kind of stuff on the venue side of things. And then I was tasked with bringing the bike community in so sure we kind of spread the word out and i kind of contacted my mates from local shops and builders and stuff like that and uh it kind of it was a bit slow on the uptake at the start because people had never really heard of it before but once it right. got traction it it blew up really quick in the last you know the two weeks leading up to it we had um over 60 bikes register to enter um in like the show and shine kind of section so we had to cut that off because we just didn't have any room for more bikes and then yeah. yeah on the day we probably had 60 to 80 other bikes rock up and then you know just a heap a heap of people on foot coming through the the venue and and in the show and the the kind of bike arena that we had set up outside as well that's that's super exciting like, I'm, I'm sure it was kind of 
uh, maybe a little nerve wracking at first, like, oh, there's nothing really happening. And all of a sudden just explosion yeah. and just, oh, what do I do now? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what it was like. We kind of, we got caught off guard a little bit and we kind of, we're like, how many bikes can we fit? So I went up with uh, Jake, the, the owner of the venue, and we kind of, we had to pace out the venue to figure out how much, you know, how many bikes we could actually fit in the show because yeah. we didn't really yeah. expect to have to think about that. You know, we figured maybe 30 or 40 bikes if we were lucky. And then it took off and we were, I think we knocked back 20 plus people saying that we didn't have room to show their bikes. So we're going to have to look for a bit more space next time. Yeah, maybe. Or at least like know that there's a limitation. Yeah, that's right. So, so what kind of, um, I have heard the term show and shine. I don't like, there was like people competing for like a prize or. Yeah. So there's like, we had, so I donated a bunch of prizes from like my apparel line, um, iron and resin garage. They're like a, a bike hangout down in Corumban on like the Southern end of the gold coast where I live. Mm -hmm. Um, and then death collective, they're like a riding gear label. Um, who else do they prizes? Bolter Brewery. They're like a local Gold Coast brewery. They like put up beer for the day and put on specials and stuff like that. So there was, uh, you know, first, second and third prizes. And then we also had a local tool shop donate like a big toolkit for like just a rough and ready bike that rocked up on the day. It wasn't generally in the show and shine. It was just like a public. Oh, bike. okay. Yeah. So we had a bunch of that stuff and the votes went in just from, both the the riders and the the people who own the bikes who weren't allowed to vote for their own bike that was like a stipulation yeah. um every bike's just got to get one vote each um and then the public that showed up on the day voted as well so um we kind of we restricted the show and shine section to kind of like cafe races scramblers trackers we had a, a really famous dirt bike racer Jeff Ballard, he's like a, an enduro champ. He's been around forever and a day. He's a local guy on the coast. So he bought a few of his like race bikes up to put on show for the day as well. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it was good, man. Really good. Um, so we had, I think there was like a, a 50s model Triumph Bobber won a prize. There's a BMW uh, Scrambler, like the R80, I think it was. Okay. Um, and a, an XS650. It was like first, second, third. Oh, nice. That that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun. Like I've 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 never I've never I, I guess I've I've been to motorcycle shows, but not that kind. You know, like not the kind yeah. where like people show up and are kind of competing. Well, we don't. It was kind of there's nothing really like that. So there are bike shows and stuff around, but a lot of them is like it's just full of like bikes that are sat in people's living rooms, you know, or, right. you know, put on display in their man cave and then dragged out for this show. Whereas we put a ride on. So if you were showing your bike, I'd probably say 80% of people rode the bikes in there. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we, we took them on a, a run through the hinterland. Um, we kind of went from iron and resin garage up through the hills and down into surface paradise, like the CBD of the Gold Coast. Um, so most of the people from around the local area joined us on that ride. We had maybe 40 or 50 bikes that morning. And then we had a bunch of guys come down from Brisbane, which is a bit further north from us. Um, so yeah, a lot of the bikes kind of, you know, they're bikes that are put on the road and, and used, not just for looking at, you know, they actually get ridden. Right. Yeah. I, that sounds like really cool. Um, do you know, uh, do you know what kind of bike won the toolkit? Like, just, you know, just like a random spectator yeah. or whatever that showed up? Yeah. So actually I know the dude, um, he, he rides, a, a CM 400. Okay. Um, yeah. it's like a, you know, the twin cylinder. Is 400. it the, the automatic one or the manual one? No, no, no! It's not an auto. It's a, it's a real okay. bike. <laughs> it has gears. There was a, there was a CM four hundred A that has like two. It has, it has a shifter on the left side, but all it has is low and high, and that's it. <laughs> Completely automatic. Good old Honda. That's not a. That's a scooter. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, have a so step through. Like you can't wear a skirt on. Like, 
it's a hilarious bike. The the guy he comes riding with us, um, and he has like he has a nice cool bike, but he um he also has this beat up thing that he rides around as well. It's like complete with like a fox tail on the key ring and all this kind of like it's just like a, a funny bike. We call it the dad wagon, and it's nice. kind of like got this huge big vinyl seat, like super comfortable to ride and really reliable, but it's just like not pretty, you know. So he won this toolkit. Um, just it was kind of parked across the street, and myself and uh and Richard was one of the event organizers, and the the guy Kalen for um United Tools. Mm-hmm. We like walked across the street and and filtered through this huge crowd of bikes that showed up and picked out the the roughest looking one to donate this thing to. So it looks like it needed it. You know that was the whole idea. <laughs> right. It's like, hey man, also, you might you yeah, might need we this. Wanted, like the Moto Social was kind of targeted as being more of like a community inclusive event so like it was our idea to kind of have that kind of thing to pull people in that didn't necessarily have a super nice bike you know but yeah i really i really like that idea yeah it's so it's a lot better than like oh i don't my bike's too ugly to bring over here they're like no bring your ugly bike you might win some tools (laughs) <laughs> that's exactly right and that's what we wanted so and also having the the ride before the show as well it kind of like lowered the bar of entry to people that could you know they don't they might have just built the bike you know and done what they wanted to it and there wasn't like there was some super nice bikes there by some really talented like bike builders and, and just garage builders as well but there was also the things that you know like a young kid has just bought his first bike and and done a bit of stuff to it in the garage and he thinks it's the best thing ever and i'm sure some other people did too so we wanted to include those guys with the whole deal i really i really like that i like the, i like the sort of like energy that that gives off like the it sounds like i got a really good vibe there it was fun man and you know like the venue organizers uh had some live music going through the day and the bolter brewery they're our beer sponsor um they're they're based down in Karum and like super local guys owned by, I know like one of the owners is Mick Fanning, like the famous surfer. Um, so they're like, they're all about that kind of like surf vibe. And it was right on the beach. Like really, there's like a super gold coast event, you know? Um, so they were kind of, it just bought like a good vibe on the day. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. everyone was having a good time. Like the sun came out for the first time that week. It was, it was awesome. Awesome. So, um, off track a little bit. What is that bike behind you? Uh, this is I. I just finished this thing. I I took it out to get it photographed yesterday. So, this I built for a guy in uh, in Townsville. If um, your listeners don't know where that is, Google it. It's like in North Queensland near the Great Barrier Reef. I just finished it the other day. I like. I was in a mad rush because I didn't think I'd get it done. And then it got to the point I was a week out from Moto Social. And I kind of, I was like, you know, if I kind of push myself a bit, I can get this damn thing finished. So I finished it the day before Moto Social in amongst like running around like a madman trying to organize this bloody event. Um, it's a 2007 model Yamaha Scorpio. I, I don't know if you guys have them there. They're like, um, they're I huge. I'm gonna look it's one like up a, now, though. Yeah, they're like a little runaround. Not a lot of meta, like not a lot of people have have heard of them. I think a lot of guys know about them in Australia because they're everywhere in Bali. And that's oh, like, I have I have seen these. We don't have them over here, but I, I I have seen these in like pictures and stuff of yeah, like Asian countries. Yeah, so they're kind of. I think they're like a super solid little engine. They're a copy of an XT two two five. And a TTR 225, I think, which is like a dirt bike. I think they sell yeah. those in the US. They do, um, yeah. They're they're also like like visually, they look like a Suzuki GS 500, but even smaller. Yeah, they're just like a, a single cylinder air cooled runaround. Yeah, it's like it's a super fun bike to ride. You know, I was kind of skeptical at the start. I said to the guy that owns it, I was like, "You sure you want to, you know, drop a, a bit of money into this bike?" Yeah, I think he bought it for like twelve hundred dollars. You know, they're super cheap. Mm-hmm. And he said that he was in Bali or something and he, he rode one around and just fell in love with it. So he just, he wants one for himself up in Townsville to hoon around on in town and like through the back streets and, and, you know, just kind of 
city riding. It's heaps of fun, but you can get it out on the highway and it'll hold its own as well. Nice. I've got, I've actually got, I'm going to see if I can share a picture with you. I found one from a company called uh, Island Motorcycles and they're in Bali. Um, yep. Made, they made like a, like a, a scrambler, I guess, version of it. Where's the screen share button? Yeah, they're like a they're like a builder's staple over there. That's like an SR five hundred here or in the US. You know, they're they're everywhere, and everyone likes to have a crack at customizing them. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool little beach hopper looking thing. Yeah. Um, Deus do a heap of them as well. You know. Yeah. But I see a lot of them done in like the um like that style that you just showed, like a, a little scrambler with a, a surfboard rack on the side or whatever. So I wanted you to try and do something different. This thing's like a 100% little street. It's got like the drop-down clip-on bars on it, a nice little yeah. tail cap on the rear. And like, it definitely looks, it looks like... Um, yeah, let me I'm gonna unplug you and, and give you a little tour de garage here. All right. <laughs> all right. I don't know if this will be good for anyone that's just kind of listening, but... Well, it will. It won't. I'll. I'll describe what I'm seeing. Mm. It's a garage. <laughs> you're. You're like impossible to hear now for some reason. All right. I'll come back. We'll have to have like the MTV Cribs version for your garage. Come out. It'll, be a, it'll be a short episode it's like six meters by six meters it's not not very big the uh when you mentioned getting it done like right before um right before the show i had this like flashback sort of moment of being young enough to think that orange county choppers the show was not the dumbest show on earth and um, <laughs> i was talking like, to a guy about deadlines you know like I had this image of you, like with a t- with like a camera crew ar- crew around me, and like we gotta get this bike done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's like we have an impossible deadline, and it's just like it just seems like the way that they they work, you know? Yeah. Like all right, we got a bucket of parts and a frame. You have three days to finish it. Go. Yeah. Yeah. The the only thing with that is I'm like. I'm the dickhead that's screaming at him to get it done, but I'm also the guy that needs to get it done. There's no one yelling at me. It's just myself. Yeah. My own worst enemy. Man, your boss is such a dick. I know. He's a prick. <laughs> <laughs> that is shit, too. So, uh, yeah, you went, before the show, you mentioned you, you said that you saw on Facebook or whatever that I got out on a ride. Um, we had a so the navy has this thing where um every every command in the navy has to have a motorcycle safety program um even if you don't have a motorcycle um the command has to have the program so like cuz there's going to be people that ride at every you know squadron or every on every ship yeah sure um and so that they have to like they have to have a program for like, and somebody who's the rep, you know, like the, the head of that program. Right. Um, so my friend Ray is the like lead guy for that program for our command. And like, you're supposed to do like two rides a year. Um, but it's always like the first thing to get axed, you know, cause they're like, oh, yeah. like, Hey, we're going to plan this ride. And like, Oh no, we got work to do. Not happening. Um, <clears throat> so this one was like right up to the, like the, the commanding officer of the squadron had signed off on it and said, yeah, this is that day. You guys are good to go. You know, I, you know, he'd seen the planned, um, uh, the plan for the ride and how long it was going to take. It was going to be basically all day. Yeah. Um, and he's like, yeah, that's good. Do it. Um, and the paperwork for like the thing had the, the request to do the ride had gone through this whole, the whole chain of command and the, are like one of the guys that's the head of our maintenance department at the the helicopter squadron was like like a couple days ago acted like he'd never heard of it before 
And and so Ray's like, dude, I got I, I have a thing right here that says you have been briefed and that you acknowledge that this happened and that you recommend <laughs> approval for it. Like, what's wrong? And he's like, well, I mean, like, when are you guys going to be back to get to work? And like, it's an all day thing. And like, even the day of he's like, was complaining about, you know, like, you know, people going on it. And the funny thing is, of all the people that went, I mean, was, there were nine of us. But there were only like four people that work in the maintenance department. So it, the, one of the guys was already on leave, so he wouldn't have been there anyway. Like he he was He's basically probably on just vacation. jealous he didn't get to go, man. Maybe. Um we rode um we rode up to one of the the like Native American reservations, like one of the casinos there. Um where and I, we didn't uh like outside called, of San Diego. Yeah, it's a place called Harrah's. Um, it's on the the Rincon Reservation, and it's like it's outside of Escondido. If anybody's familiar with the area, um, so we went up there and didn't anticipate that we would get there as early as we did. And so we had we had like an hour to kill before that little buffet opened because that was a plan. We we're gonna go up there, get lunch there, and then ride up to the top of this mountain called Mount Palomar. So we <laughs> we get there and it's like 10 o'clock and the the and for lunch at 10 o'clock, we're like, it's kind of early. And then they're like, yeah, the buffet isn't open until 11. It's like, so what are we going to do? Um, and uh, somebody was like... You went and shot craps, didn't you? I didn't, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think anybody did any craps, but... One of the guys we were with won 200 bucks at Black Blackjack while we waited for the buffet to open. Boom. Yeah. Damn so, it. His shout yeah. of beers at breakfast. <laughs> right? <laughs> so so yeah, we after that we we rode up to the top of this mountain and that was that was a really fun ride, like really pretty. Um it was a little hazy that day, so the view wasn't the best, but it wasn't bad. Um and then they let us into the park for free that we went to the top of. It's supposed to be like 10 bucks per vehicle. And they were like, well, how long are you going to be here? Like, I don't know, 20 minutes or something, like just to hang out, like stretch our legs a little bit, take a picture and then leave. Yeah. And they were like, if you're here for like less than 20 minutes, we're not going to worry about it. If you're going to like cool. go hike around and, you know, use the park, we're going to come after you for money <laughs> for the <laughs> for the parking. Like, OK, nature is not free. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, who do you think put this here? I don't, I don't know. Uh, All this costs money, you know. Not you. <laughs> right. Just sitting here letting these trees grow is very time consuming. Yeah, I guess um, they got maintenance and stuff. We have the same thing. Yeah, community. they do. They do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we went to this. It was, it's a state park in California. Uh, we took you can pretty much do whatever you want in state parks, right? You can ride dirt bikes and stuff in there. It depends on the They're park. Camping. This one, this one has camping and hiking, but you can't like ride a dirt bike around in it. Yeah, I got in trouble because I got confused with a national park and a state park when I was in uh, Oregon. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I camped out on the top of Crater Lake, like on the rim of the crater, oh. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I like so I rode my Harley in there. I like stashed it in the in the bush. Um. And just like I hiked maybe 10 minutes up to the edge of this crater because I wanted a nice view from where I was sleeping, you know. So I was like having a campfire, cooking some food. I just hung my hammock up. And then there was like some rustling in the trees. And these two guys rock, like popped out with a flashlight in my face. Like, what are you doing here? I said to them, I was like, mate, I'm just uh, cooking some food. I'm about to go to sleep. What's up? I'm like, why are you here? I'm like, this is where I'm camping. What's your problem? <laughs> There were no signs saying that I couldn't camp, and then yeah. these guys yeah. like, they took pity on me because they were just like, "Oh, this guy's an idiot Australian, you know." So the guys kind of explained to me that I violated a heap of federal laws. They were like federal police or something. They explained to me, yeah, and uh, they were asking me if I had guns or drugs and all this stuff. I was like, "Man, I'm just a, a guy riding a bike camping out here," so. You know, they informed me and they fined me for having a fire um, on the, the rim of Crater Lake and kicked me out. So it was like midnight, it was freezing, and I had nothing but 
like dark goggles to ride in because I didn't oh. ride. Oh, okay. I, I ride, do my riding during the day. I camp out and, and go to the beach or whatever at night. That was the plan. Um, so they kind of told me that I'd broken all these rules and kicked me out. And they made me ride like an hour down the street in like the dark, freezing my nuts off because it was super cold <laughs> just to go to this camp spot. So I've rocked up at this camp spot just after midnight. There's families and stuff everywhere because it was holiday season. And I'm on this like unmuffled soft tail. It was so late. Like if I, if I blasted past cars parked on the street, the alarm went off. That's how loud it was. Right. And I was a hated man in Oregon that day, I swear. <laughs> All these people, I, I woke up in the morning, they're all kind of giving me dirty looks. Like, that was the guy who came in last night. It's like, there's that asshole. Yeah, I know. So that's my story yeah. about getting confused with state parks and national parks. Don't do there's, it, kids. There's also, the our federal park system also has like, so there's national parks and then national wildernesses or something. <laughs> Um, like wilderness preserves preserver and like national or wildlands. National wildlands are like I'm basically a free for all. Like I don't I I know there must be some rules about them, but national wildlands or wild wilderness or whatever the heck they are, um, you can like you can camp, you can you know ride dirt bikes, do whatever you want, wherever you want. As long as you're not like, you know, burning the place down or something. But then, yeah, like the parks are kind of like, this is pristine. We need to keep it this way. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, yeah. I, but like, you know, one one guy camping on the rim of the lake is not going to kill anyone. Yeah, that, it was like a total fire ban and stuff. And I took it yeah. as, you know, because I couldn't see any signs that said no camping. Mm hmm. And, you know, here, if it doesn't say no camping, you can camp there. Like, if no one cares that you're going to do it, you can do it. But yeah. they kind of politely and very firmly informed me that in America, it's different. So unless there's a sign saying that you can camp there, you can't camp there. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'll try to remember that as well. I might need that information myself. Yeah. I mean, I, one of my one of my least favorite things about camping on a trip in one the time I've times I've done it is that if you you end up in these designated campgrounds so often. That sucks. And like no one likes said, doing that. Yeah, like you said, there's just, you know, there's a bunch of people and families and RVs and trailers and whatever. And it's like I have a motorcycle and a tent. Yeah, I would like to be able to just go somewhere that isn't full of you people and just camp there. Yeah. I think I haven't been able to do much of it because my, uh, my bike that I have at the moment doesn't really lend itself to a long trips and b carrying anything. It's like super naked, but yeah. I think in the next couple of months, I'm going to kick off with another project that I'll, I'll build for myself that I can kind of do some long trips on and, and build it so I can stash some gear on and, and start doing a bit of camping up and down the coast in Australia for sure. That'd be cool. Yeah. You need the kind of bike that you can do it, you know, like my yeah. GS 550 is like a, a straight street kind of short trip and it's heaps of fun around the twisties, but you know, you get it on the highway and it's pretty boring and just kind of not fun to be on for any length of time. Yeah. I, I recently, switched my handlebars and foot pegs back to the stock positions oh yeah and yesterday was the longest i've ridden in that position since i switched it i'm on the fence like i go back and forth about whether or not i want to just put the clip-ons back on it just depends on what kind of riding you want to do if you have the luxury of being able to have a few bikes you set yeah the the wife's suzuki gs500 is is the position that you know the stock triumph was so like i'm considering like maybe just switching back so and then just ride the wife's bike when i want to be upright the only problem with that thing is it's 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 not running as well as the triumph runs it's got like this thing where uh i mean it leaks oil and i don't it's that's what being, bikes are for 
That's how you know they're alive. If they're leaking oil, oil, that means they have a pulse. (laughs) Um, But so it leaks a little oil, whatever, not a big deal. Um, But the the last two times I've ridden it, a couple times ago, I rode to work, no problems. Rode home, and then when I when I was pulling into my like, you know, apartment complex thing, it would not idle below. It wouldn't idle. Like it just when he had closed the throttle, it would go down to like 4,000 RPM and just sit there. Oh yeah. We spoke about this like a week yeah. ago. I remember. And then this last time I wrote it, I was like, I don't know what caused that. I'm just going to write it again and see what happens. <laughs> so, so I did. And then this time it comes back down to idle, but not quickly. Like it doesn't just return, like, you know, drop back down. It's like, it comes down and when it hits like three or four, it kind of, slowly comes down from there yeah right i can only assume it is carbureted carburetor related um yeah i was talking to jess my wife about it and i was like honestly this is the bike that we got for you to learn how to ride on and just to beat the hell out of you're probably not because it doesn't seem to happen until the bike gets really hot and has been ridden for a while Mm -hmm. like you're probably not soon anyway going to encounter the problem and it's not like debilitating in any way because as soon as you let the clutch out it dropped the engine you know the rpm drops down to match you know the wheel speed and it's hardly like affecting riding the bike at all yeah you still don't want to be dealing with that problem though no i don't know how proficient you are just take the carbs apart and have a look man it's probably just some gunk in there but you know they maybe need a bit of a cleanup if she's been beating the hell out of it for a while that's the thing she hasn't like no it's been hardly ridden since we got it all running i got the car the carbs are completely clean that's the funny the crazy part like it's hardly been ridden at all since we um since we did anything to i'm the only one that's really ridden it much yeah i think like i don't know those gs 500s if they have the like CV carbs, vacuum carbs. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think, I mean, don't quote me on this, but if you leave them sitting for a while, those like um, the vacuum umbrellas in the top oh, of the, the car. Diaphragm? Yeah, the diaphragm, that's the word I'm looking for. And they can get like stiff and stuff, you know? So maybe it just yeah. needs to be. Tough. Give it some crash. Come on. Yeah, just, just beat the hell out of it. Like, really. I mean, I every ride, every time I ride it to work, um, I'm doing about 90 miles an hour on the, the GS500. Yeah, so, you guys are fuckers for the speed limit over there. No one cares about those signs on the side of the road. <laughs> I, I learned that really quick. It's like the, the speed limit's 60 and I, I like test rode my bike and it could do 70. So I was happy, you know, and then I jump yeah. on a highway, especially in Southern California, like between LA and San Diego yep. is a shit show. <laughs> and no one cares they just like blast past you yep so that, yeah if you're doing you know, 70 on you know you're in the uh, slow lane right and cars just like Boom. yeah and i was like trucks and stuff as well yeah i've i was i don't know i mean, have i think i've told this story on on the show before but i was riding home one day and I don't know exactly how fast I was going. I wasn't like looking down at my speedometer, but I was going a little faster than everybody else on the road. And so it had to have been like 85 to 90. Mm -hmm. And out of the corner of my eye, I see a California highway patrolman on a motorcycle in the same lane as me pull up next to me and just go like wave his hand down, like slow down. Oh, you want to race? (laughs) he like he goes like this like slow down a little and so i eased off and he gives me a thumbs up and then he just rides off like (laughs) that blast past you yeah just like well he's allowed to do it he's gonna tell him what to do right yeah man on that uh moto social ride that we did i just found out yesterday um one of the boys was riding behind someone on like an old cb750 And this guy, so we went up this, it's like quite a steep road called the Panorama. It takes you up the hill and then you kind of level out and get this nice view of the Gold Coast. You see the ocean and stuff. Yeah. Um, And then you come down the other side and it's kind of just as steep on the other side. And he said that he was riding behind this guy and this guy was kind of 
given it a heap up the hill and, and then down it as well. And, you know, like he could smell his brakes. So he kind of like eased back a bit because he thought it was his bike. And they got to, at the end, there's like an intersection. You got to like stop and give way. So this guy pulls up at the intersection <laughs> and then his brakes just like boom on the back. Like oh. burst into flames. This poor guy had to jump off his bike and try like, get. He, I think he said he took his gloves off and tried to like beat the fire out on this guy's bike. So funny. Wow. Because like wow. if you, you know, you get 40 or 50 old bikes kind of out on the road and give them a heap, you got to expect something like that to happen, you know? Yeah. yeah. The risk you take. Especially going, you know, uh, like down like a long grade. Yeah. This, I think I heard that that guy as well, shortly after that, like rear ended a car maybe on our way into the venue in Surface Paradise or something. I don't know. <laughs> He's a real winner. Yeah, I know. He probably loved the event too. He was like, oh, greatest day of my life. Yeah. Have you, uh, have you ever ha- heard of a slow race? No. So, okay. So, is that an it, oxymoron? Is this a joke? Is, this, no. is, that, is this the start of a joke? <laughs> no. I mean, I could make a really socially unacceptable joke about people with learning disabilities, but. No, don't do that. <laughs> I'll just let everybody imagine <laughs> that I, what it would have been. Um, but uh, so, no, there. I was. I just you talking about this event made me think of uh, the mods versus rockers event that I went to a couple times up in San Diego or Seattle, um, and the club that put them on would hold uh, what they called slow races, and it just sounds like something that would be really fun to do with the guys next time at Moto Social. Um, you you have, you know, I don't know, fifty to you know, a hundred feet worth of space and you, you start everybody on one end and the last person to get to the finish line wins. Oh yeah. I've seen this and you got to like creep your bike without putting your feet on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So whoever, yeah, I've yeah, seen that. Put a foot down. Um, there was a guy that was on a moped and he was using his feet to pedal against the direction of the wheel spinning to keep oh, himself. Like, oh, so it was on like a pedal start moped. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it, was, it was really cool. He didn't win, but it was only because he lost his balance and like fell over and put his foot down. Yeah. Um, they also had like kickstart challenges um, to see who could like get like kickstart their bike with one kick. Like the the most number of times like you had to kick it, have it start and then stop it. Yeah, and right. then kick it and have it start and then like just put a single kick. Yeah, okay. Um, there was this guy there on a Vespa that had it was like a you know a vintage Vespa that had his bike so perfectly dialed in, like every time he just like tapped the the Kickstarter, it was it was on, you know. Yeah, nice. No. We but, think uh, like it would be cool to do that kind of thing, but that takes a lot of room. So where the venue yeah. is, it's a bar. And then you have a street, like a a street, and then across from that you have like a, a pedestrian esplanade where everyone kind of walks, and there's room there, and then it's just like straight onto the beach, so we're super okay. close. But we had a bit of drama with like getting uh, council approval and stuff because we we organised the thing in like four weeks, you know, we didn't have much lead up, but that kind of thing you got to deal with, like. Yeah, you know, public safety and all that kind of stuff. I think I feel like America plays a bit fast and loose with that kind of stuff, whereas we're a little bit more bubble wrapped over here. Maybe, yeah. Plus, the the club that put on the event has their their clubhouse is in like an industrial oh, okay. area. Yeah, perfect. and it's they they just have like all this space and no one watching. Yeah, like, and I think that that's another part of it is like in the United States, we're like. You can do whatever you want as long as nobody sees it. Like it's sort of like the mentality. <laughs> it's not um, illegal until you get caught, right? Right. Yeah. Like there's like this mentality that like, well, if nobody's showing up to stop you, it must be okay. <laughs> Unless you're camping. Yeah. No camping. <laughs> then it's not all right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you ever enjoy that nature? No. That would be ten dollars per motorcycle, please. Um, 
that was the other thing like we were joking like if it was 10 bucks a bike we were just gonna park our bikes like up farther away and like double up so like everybody's got two people on the back of their bike cheap skates cut our cost in half yeah i rode with my boss on the back of my bike the other day um oh that's cute (laughs) He, yeah he rides Nothing like two dudes on a motorcycle man yeah. that's good living <laughs> <laughs> he he rides uh he rides to work almost every day and um i he, he so on our on the base we have a like an auto shop you know where like they, they work on your car or whatever and it's tends to be significantly cheaper than similar places out off the base so he had like brought his truck in, but also had his bike at work. Um, so he dropped his truck off and he called um, our shop. And he's like, hey, can can somebody come give me a ride back over from the auto shop so I don't have to walk? And we were like, yeah, sure. So I went out to his bike and I grabbed his helmet and rode over to pick him up. And he's and he just like he's like just laughing and shaking his head. He's like, you son of a bitch. He's like, I hate you. <laughs> And then we got stuck at like every red light, you know, on the way back. He was like, this it figures. Now everybody's going to see us. Sitting on the back blowing kisses to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and then like the one of the other guys in the shop like took a video of us as we pulled back into the parking lot and made like a screenshot of it. His like desktop background. And it's, al- <laughs> it's also on this big, uh, this big TV we have in the shop. It's up on the wall. So it's like this constant still image of never forget. It'll probably last for another few days before we change it. <laughs> well, just that he's yeah. always making like, like super, like like really dumb jokes about like sharing, uh, like sharing food, Lady in the Tramp style or something. Like 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 anybody. <laughs> and so so we're like, fine. You want you want to play this game? We'll play this game. Oh, there's nothing wrong with doubling your buddy on the bike. Yeah. It's when they're, they're it's when they're like sitting on the tank facing you that it becomes a problem. Okay. If they're on the back, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the, we the the Navy has like this pretty strict um, fraternization policy between like officer and enlisted, and he's an officer and I'm enlisted. And I yeah. was like, does this count as fraternization because we are both riding on the same motorcycle? Like, is this unduly familiar? <laughs> Just a couple of dudes enjoying each other's company, man. Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> enjoying the warm comfort of each other's bodies. <laughs> oh, too far. <laughs> <laughs> I changed out the, I the, like the other day I got to work and I noticed one of my forks was leaking. Um, and so I changed out the seals and then also got a bushing kit to replace the bushings on there. I felt like such an idiot. I forgot that there's a little metal like spring clip that holds the seal in. And so I'm like trying to get them apart. I'm like, why aren't they coming apart? I like put the forks in a vice and I'm like yanking on them. I'm like, what the hell? Why isn't it coming apart? You get covered in oil in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Like everything in the garage is <laughs> just completely covered in fork oil. And I'm like, I, and then I look down at the kit for all the replacement parts. And I was like, what are those little, oh, those little spring things in there hold the f- seals in. That light bulb went off, huh? That means they're in my bike now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I sent, so this bike behind me, I, I sent a, a couple of pictures to the guy because he's, Townsville is maybe, I think it's like eight hours drive from here. So it'd be like you making a bike for someone who lives in, you know, Sacramento or something like that. Yeah. They're just yeah. ages away. So I've just, I've been sending him pictures during the build and whatnot. And like, you know, when I put the new headlight and stuff on, I'd send him some pics and I sent him a photo of the finished bike and like it was running and he's like, sweet, can I pick it up? I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) Once you get the bike going, there's a bunch of other shit that has to happen too. So I've been like working through, I've got to replace the fork seals and, you know, tune it properly. And right. I put a new flat slide carburetor on it. So I have to like rejet that and, and set the needle properly and stuff. Which I've just about got done, but these little things are hard to find parts for, you know, cause they're an Indo bike and they're not really common over here. So mm-hmm. I have to source a lot of parts out of Indonesia, which is a whole other issue in itself, like dealing internationally with parts. 
especially when I don't speak English. Like, oh man. Yeah, I can imagine that's tough. Um, yeah, well, that's that that's a... why I started making my own damn parts because I don't have to rely on anyone else for them. You know. <laughs> yeah. Got them here, easy. Is that a is that an LED headlight? Yeah, that's that's like a new thing that I'm I'm doing now. So, um, that's like a, a customized one. The ones that I I make or produce to sell are like a black anodized finish. Um, but I just kind of like stripped and polished that one because the rest of the bike is a silver and blue. So, yeah. um, they're like I'm gonna start selling them in the next maybe like three or four weeks. So they're like an LED. Um, with a CNC machined bezel. So they'll fit onto pretty much any bike with the fork mounted headlights. And they also have a bottom mount option as well, like the bait style mount that mounts onto yeah. the bottom yeah. triple tree. Um, they come in like a five and three quarter inch and a seven inch headlight as well. And uh, they've like their DOT approved, which I think is the American one. And they're also E marked, which is our Australian kind of standard as well. So, wow. Yeah, that's that's a prototype that I have on that little bike at the moment. Um, and uh, there's a couple others like kicking around in circulation as well. You probably saw that Triumph Scrambler that I built a while back. Mm -hmm. um, that has one of the headlights on it. That was like one of the first prototypes. So I like always, you know, get a couple and road test them and kind of figure out the kinks. And then this one is like the final version and the the stock of them is going to be coming in pretty soon. That, that's exciting. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm stoked about a it. There's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's not like DOT approved, and yeah, that's that a big battle for me as well. Being like a small time guy, um, seeking that approval is like first of all, it's hard to figure out how to get that approval, and then secondly, like the cost involved in getting that like certification of this product being legit is like expensive and just difficult in general so this one's like it's cool because it's totally street legal and you know can i could send it anywhere and not have dramas with your you know traffic authority or whoever yeah, yeah. it's kind of a i know that um where I, where i grew up they're they're really picky about turn signals um mm -hmm. there's they have to be nine inches apart at least uh, yeah, we have the same rules here. And like, if they're not uh, like DOT approved, then like there there are cops that'll pull you over and find and like you know hit you with a uh, like a citation like all the time. <laughs> yeah. And then there's also like uh, there's state in so we had where I'm from we had state vehicle inspections every year so you had to bring your vehicle in and they would inspect it and then you know check it to make sure it's running properly and everything works. But um, if you if you brought your motorcycle in and you had um, you know stuff that wasn't DOT approved or whatever, and mm -hmm. the people signed off on your state inspection anyway, they could eventually go after this the inspectors too. Yeah, right. Um, and they they had, they had kind of started doing that with the motorcycles shops that were state inspectors. That they were like the the police were putting a lot of pressure on those people, but the so like, because anybody that was a vehicle state inspector could inspect motorcycles or cars. Okay. And so like everybody that I knew that rode with like questionable stuff on their bike would just go to car shops to get their motorcycle inspected because those places didn't know anything didn't about. Know. Oh, right. Really? Cheeky devils. Yeah. I mean, the, the, when I, the last time I got my motorcycles inspected, I pulled in and they had me operate everything. Like usually... Yeah, they take your vehicle away from you for a few minutes and like bring it back. You're like, okay, your inspection's good, but like they're like, okay, turn, hit your front brake, now hit your rear brake. Okay, honk your horn and turn both your signals on like individually. Yeah, flip your high beam up and down. Okay, cool. Doot, doot, doot. Here you go. Yeah, we have a similar system here. They're like the way I so the way I get around that kind of stuff. So the LED indicators that I make um they're not e-marked but they're incredibly bright like way brighter than your standard kind of thing so yeah. i think like the general check that we get over here if you get pulled over and checked which is super rare um is like 
I've heard of people having the the police like sit their bike at a point and then run a measuring tape out like 30 or 50 meters back. And if you can see them from that far away, you're like, you're all good. That's fine. So yeah. I like, that's how I test my lights. And they don't like, they don't have that little mark, but they meet the standard that they have to. So, I mean, hopefully one day I can get that stupid thing because that kind of yeah. opens me up to being able to sell in Europe. They're kind of super strict with those markings and stuff. But um, as far as the US goes, like I've bought stuff out of there before and it's 50-50 whether it's kind of uh, DOT approved or not. A lot of the custom stuff you get doesn't have it. So Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that's not yeah. DOT approved. Yeah, I'm going to start looking for like, once I release this headlight and also got like a bunch of new three button switches coming out too, um, probably release next week. I just got all the, the stuff in and assembled them. Um, start looking for like resellers or distributors over in the U S to kind of, cause I have a lot of customers that come from there that buy stuff and they just get kind of these huge shipping bills. Cause I'm sending it all the way from here in like a single package. So I'm going to look for a shop maybe in California or or something like that to stock my gear and and send all my customers their way to kind of save them on the, on the huge shipping costs, you know, because it's just domestic, which is way cheaper. Yeah. um, I might have an idea, but I don't know. Well, if anyone's listening that has a bike shop around Cali or whatever, I'm coming over in September. So get at me. Yeah. What what are you, what are you coming over for in September? If you, if you could. Oh man. I have this whole second life where I'm a dirty hippie that goes to Burning Man. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I've so I'm you're coming a over. Man. I'm coming over in late August, I think. Yeah, late August because Burning Man's end of August. So I'm coming over in late August and hanging out. I'll be around the LA area for a while and then heading up to Sacramento and then into Nevada for Burning Man. And I got some mates getting married in uh, Mexico afterwards. So we're oh, going to go down oh. there for the wedding and then I'll probably come back and hang around in maybe San Diego or something with some friends for a while. I want to try buy a couple of bikes while I'm there, like, and send them back to, I'm chasing like some old, uh, some old like fifties or sixties model triumphs, like pre-unit mm-hmm. triumphs mm-hmm. and uh, a couple of two strokes as well. Cause they're pretty hard to find around here. So I want to buy like, you know, there's like, old air-cooled RD 350s from the yeah. early 70s. I want to get a couple of those because it's just super fun. The, um, well, I'm pretty sure I, I, for some reason, I'm like blanking on what pre-unit means. So pre-unit is, I think like Triumph switched in 1966, I think. So pre-unit is where you have the, the engine, uh, and, and crank the is, is separate, is separate right? to the gearbox. Yeah. So you have like okay. a primary drive belt or chain that links the two. So if your gearbox craps out, you can like uncouple the gearbox and switch it out without the, the engine having to be torn apart kind of thing. Okay. And then unit construction yeah. is everything is one lump. Yeah, exactly. So n- like a perfect example is... Bullshit. So you like your Harley diners and soft tails and stuff like that are gearbox separate. So mm-hmm. they're um, they're like not unit construction. And then your Harley Sportsters are a unit construction where the gearbox and an engine is in like the same thing. Okay, that's all familiar now that you've said it. Like I, it's like I know what this is, but I can't think of what it means. There you go, mate. I know what this these is the motorcycle are. education hour with your host Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. If you're while well, you're in San Diego or whatever, yeah, like uh, hit me up. I, I'll I should be here. I have no yeah, for sure, man. I might even bring you some gear to chuck on your bike. That'd be awesome. I wouldn't argue with that at all. All right. Um, I'll send you home with stickers, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, I'll have a shirt by then. Oh shit. We might have swag. I love. Keep, I love a bit of merch. We keep. It's funny. We get right up to having shirts and then don't. It's like. It's like yeah. yeah. Nope. Nope. Not yet. It's like I just. I don't know. I should just. It's like a, and do it. a whole. It's like a whole little trade in itself. So between like myself and and local builders or local like you know shops that that stock my my gear or whatever. Um, 
they'll be like, Hey man, you know, send me a t-shirt or like I'd have these hats made now as well. Yeah. Like yeah. send me some stuff and then we'll do like a merch swap. So they'll send me a t-shirt from their shop because you know, they're, they're just guys like me. They're working in a workshop environment. So a black shirt is like the staple. Yeah. You can't get a grease stain on a black shirt. So there's this, I was talking to a guy, he's just kind of, he's setting up his shop at the moment in Newcastle area um called black cat customs and he's like send me your address i'll send you some merch so next week i gotta do a merch swap with him send him some swag of mine and he sends me some up you know yeah it's a good little like you know it's these guys are you know this we're part all part of the same game so it's cool to have that like little community and that group of buddies you know around the um your i just noted your your logo um looks similar to like some of our triangular like road signs here in the u.s oh yeah um and then there's a company called twisted throttle that theirs is upside down it's a you know like a triangle like yours but upside down and it's reflective yellow just like the like the road signs oh that's pretty cool <clears throat> yeah um i've got i bought a lot of things from them and put them on several motorcycles <laughs> um but yeah, so is there anything? What, what, where can people find you and your your motorcycle stuff and your merchandise and all that sort of stuff? Like, how, uh, how can people find you if they're you know interested? On the internet, I'm everywhere. Um, so I've got my website is purposebuiltmoto.com, and then you know same thing on Facebook and Instagram. Um, if you want to get in touch, shoot me an email at tom at purposebuiltmoto.com. And then also, if you want to check out what we're doing with uh, Moto Social, there's like a huge um, gallery of all the bikes that we have show up on the day and stuff. So we had like a roving photographer there. You can go on Facebook to Moto Social GC um, and check out like there's a, a big gallery of the custom bikes and the crowd and the band that we had playing that day and stuff. And then I think in the next couple of weeks, we're going to release like a promo video as well. So we had a... Uh, a, a bit of like a film crew kicking around there a local guy um what's his name tyson shot by tice he came along for the day and filmed us like riding from iron and resin garage and then we did like a, a, a bit of a shoot through the hills and then down and filmed the day at sandbar of all the guys kind of getting together and having some beers and a good time i guess yeah nice that sounds that sounds good so yeah it's pretty uh, interesting like even if you're not a local guy to get on and check it out it's pretty cool yeah. Um, so everybody check purposebuiltmoto.com out um, and Moto Social GC on Facebook for the Moto Social stuff. You can find me at all the same sorts of places at caferacerpodcast.com and just look for Cafe Racer Podcast in, all, in any of your favorite social media things, unless your favorite social media thing is Snapchat. I don't, <laughs> we don't have a presence there because I don't really understand that. Because um, you're not a 14 year old girl, I guess. I'm, yeah, I'm <laughs> or a DJ Khaled. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little too old for Snapchat, I guess. Um, and then uh, thank you to everybody that supported us on Patreon. We've had a few new people uh, support the show. And I've added all of the n- most recent people to the Slack group. If you haven't gotten the email and you're like, hey, what happened? Why didn't you get an email? Uh, shoot me an email at crash at caferacerpodcast.com and I'll figure out what was going on there. Maybe it went to your spam folder or who knows. But w- having said all that, Thank you to everybody that supports the show. Uh, Tom, it was great having you again. And, yeah. uh, you know, anytime, you're welcome to come on the show. Yeah, it's always fun, man. Good catch up. Hopefully, I'll see you in uh, in September when I'm out. Yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, everybody, get out and ride.